Welcome to the IEC 61850 Edition 2 eLearning module. In this module, we'll cover the following topics. First, we'll begin with an introduction that will outline the major changes that occurred in Edition 2. Next, in Goose versus our Goose, we'll look at the differences between a standard Goose and a routable Goose. In Security, we'll take a look at how the our Goose is secured outside the substation. In Testing, we'll take a look at the changes to testing that were implemented into the standard. Next, We'll discuss the Goose simulation bit, what it is, its role within the standard. And finally, we'll take a look at mirror, mirroring control information and how it applies to testing a device while it is connected to the system. So let's begin. Here's a brief summary of some of the major changes that were incorporated into IEC 61850 Edition 2. A distinct logical devices hierarchy where the logical nodes have been grouped in specific logical device headings. Improvements in the substation configuration language tool. In addition to the standard removes some of the ambiguity that was associated with file creation that allows for a more robust tool to generate mapping of 61850 signals across multiple vendors' products. Service tracking refers to the mirroring of control information. We'll talk more about this later in the presentation. With addition to, there are specific solutions for redundancy and how they must be implemented to avoid lost communications through the use of Parallel Redundancy Protocol, PRP, or IEEE 1588. With the expansion of communications across the wide area network, a security mechanism was defined to meet strict requirements for cybersecurity. New ways to test the device while still connected to the system without impacting normal operation. Declaration of multicast subscri subscription information guidelines and authorizing and authenticating subscribers in the network. And finally, in IEC 61850 Edition 2, GSSE is no longer supported and has been officially removed from the standard. Next, we'll look at the data model. If you have an understanding of the data model of IEC 61850, you should recognize the format of object-oriented programming. Let's take a quick review of this. The physical device is also known as the IED name. The logical device defines the data group type, which we'll discuss in detail next. The logical nodes define the type of information that will be received. The functional constraint groups the logical node into categories. For example, uh, ST for status, DC for description, MX for measurement. The data breaks down the category further, such as volts, amps, breaker position. And the last part is the, is the value in this case, phase eight magnitude. In other data groups, we could be monitoring the status of a breaker. Is it open or is it closed? We could also be monitoring a quality data or a timestamp. There are 16 logical devices. Six are predefined. Out of the 16 logical devices, 15 are configurable. One is fixed and hard coded that cannot be altered. The configurable logical devices increases the level of customization and ease of integration for advanced IEC 618 users. Let's review the six predefined logical device categories. The first one is master, which contains the logical nodes that pertain to communications, including Goose, Reports, Remote I.O., Direct I.O., Virtual Inputs, Modbus, DNP, and so on. The next one is protection, which contains just just all that, all the protection functions. Control contains the control and monitoring functions. System contains power system, devices such as breakers, switches, CTs, VTs, so on, including interface to, to things such as the AC inputs, contact I.O., transducer I.O., and hard fiber I.O. Meter contains metering and measurements other than PMU, including signal sources. And finally, general contains the flex logic, virtual outputs, non-volatile latches, flex elements, and records, and things such as oscillography, the data logger, uh, security, the front panel, and the clock. Next, let's focus on the master logical device. The master logical device has seven logical nodes associated with it that are a fixed assignment and cannot be altered. Let's review the seven logical nodes and what they are. The first one is the LPHD1, which is the physical device info and contains the physical device info such as the vendor, software revision, serial number, model number. 
relay name, physical location such as latitude, longitude, and altitude, and if there's any other errors. Next is the LLN0, which is logical node 0, and it provides the status of the settings groups, the goose and report control blocks, and data sets, and indicating the status of the relay, whether it's on, off, or in test mode. LGOS is used for Goose subscription monitoring, such as the RX Goose status and data associated with the subscription Goose configuration. GGIO1 is used for unmapped FlexLogic operands, such as Contact IO, brick items such as Field IO and Field Transducer. GGIO2 is used for virtual input control. GGIO3 is used for monitoring subscription Goose inputs, both analog and digital signals. And finally, GGIO4 is used for unmapped flex analog operands. These are analog values that have not been mapped to a logical node. Let's take a look at the substation architecture. In addition to one of the standard, the focus was based on substation communication using a local area network and standard Goose messaging. In addition to two of the standard, the focus is based on substation to substation communications going beyond the safe confines of the substation and communications utilizing the wide area network and securing the data within a new type of goose called the routable goose. In this section we'll discuss the differences between a standard goose and a routable goose. In addition one, the goose communication was confined within the substation. There were no external connections to the outside world and as such no real security was needed. The Goose message is published using a broadcast approach on a local area network where one source was available to many. As we expand Goose messages beyond the security of the substation, the potential for cyber attacks needed to be addressed to avoid a rogue identity from gaining access and possibly crippling the electrical infrastructure. A group known as NERC CIP, North American Electric Reliability Corporation, critical infrastructure protection, coordinated efforts to improve the power system security. As part of the plan, it requires the use of firewalls to block vulnerable ports and the implementation of cyber attack monitoring tools. In other words, the firewall concept isolates the traffic between a trusted local area network and an untrusted wide area network by filtering the communications that go in and out of the substation. The Routable Goose concept was created for substation and substation communications across a wide area network. Previously, we spoke about the standard Goose where we were broadcasting to everyone. In the Routable Goose, the message will use a multicast approach on a wide area network and only send a message to intended recipients. Based on this, a security issue was raised. The Routable Goose will need to implement a security component to authorize and authenticate those recipients. We'll talk more about that in the next section. Let's take a look at what happens to a standard goose and a routable goose when they reach a firewall on a router. The standard goose is a multicast layer 2 messaging service originally intended for use only within a LAN environment. Goose messages don't have an IP address or transport capabilities. When it reaches a router, the firewall doesn't know what to do with it and drops into a bit bucket, essentially blocking it from getting past the router. The Argoose is a multicast layer 3 messaging service designed for use in a wide area network environment. It has UDP and IP headers assigned to it, which allows the Argoose message to pass through the router's firewall. Here we have a list of protocols that are available with a sample value, SV. Synchrophasers are now known as the routable sample values, RSV. The Goose message, the routable Goose, or the Argoose. PTP, Precision Time Protocol, uh, and also IEEE 1588. SNTP, Simple Network Time Protocol. And MMS, Manufacturing Messaging Specification. You'll see the only difference between the Goose and the Argoose is the UDP IP header. The guidelines for synchrophasers as far as security and transportation have been adapted to the Routable Goose. In the next section, we'll take a look at how we secure the Argoose. In this section, we'll take a look at how the Routable Goose is kept secure. 
In a secure network, the publisher is streaming multicast data onto the network. The subscribers are monitoring and listening for the data. Everything appears to be secure. What happens if we have a security breach? The intruder could, in effect, publish incorrect or damaging data. The subscribers would not know any better. The subscribed data appears to be coming from the appropriate source. What assurance does the subscriber have that the data is from the intended source? To ensure the subscribers are getting the right data, the standard specifies that when multicasting over IP networks, IGMP version 3, or Internet Gateway Management Protocol, must be used. IGMP version 3 varies from earlier versions of IGMP in that the subscribers to the multicast address are filtered on the source IP address of the publisher. This is referred to as source filtering. Source filtering allows the routers to select the appropriate path to deliver the multicast instead of delivering to all possible paths. IGMP version 3 is used on both IP version 4 and IP version 6 networks. IGMP version 3 operates within the substation's land to the local router observing the IGMP traffic. To ensure the subscribers are still active, the local multicasting router notifies the subscriber to confirm whether the subscriber is still online. If there is no response from the subscriber, the communication link is broken. A protocol called Protocol Independent Multicast, also known as PIM, monitors the networks to make sure that the subscribers are still requesting data. It has an automatic breakdown feature which means it will drop the link to a specific, to a specific subscriber if the requests stop. The technical report 61850-90-5 defines on how the routable goose must be secured with a wide area network. First it defines a secure hash algorithm. It uses an SHA-2 known as secure hash algorithm version 2 hash code which is used for message authentication and integrity similar to a CRC that places a tamper detection on the message. Next it defines an encryption algorithm. The one currently being used is called Advanced Encryption Standard, AES. The message is locked by the publisher and the subscriber needs the key to unlock it. The technical report also defines a key management system. Using RFC 6407, the group domain of interpretation, the system manages the keys to all members in the group, meaning the publishers and subscribers. This key is also incorporated when generating hash and encryption algorithms. Next. It also defines that the group members are issued a certificate once they've been verified for auth authorization and authenticated as valid members in the group. With all the security defined, the Rotable Goose is encapsulated in a very neat data packet. 61850-90-5 provides the capability to convey messages in a data packet known as the Session Protocol Data Unit, or otherwise known as SPDU. This supports secure tunneling of the Ethernet-based Goose to facilitate easier exchange between substation and control centers. It has two portions. It has a header and session user. Let's quickly review each part of the SPDU. The goose identifier indicates what type of payload there is, whether this is a goose or a sampled value. The SPDU length is the size of the SPDU, header content, and payload. The SPDU number is a value used to detect duplicates or out-of-order packets. This is maintained by the sender and starts with zero and increments with each subsequent SPDU. The version, this is the version of the 61850-90-5 protocol that is being used. The time of current key is a security attribute which represents the time at which the current signature and encryption key was first used. Time to next key is a security attribute that represents the time before another key is put into use for signature and encryption. It is recommended that the key distribution center changes the symmetric keys used for signatures and encryption at least every 48 hours. The value is specified in minutes. A minimum time to next key is expected to be 30 minutes. This value should be used for updates of the keys in situations where the current key has been compromised. The security is not used. 
Next is the key ID, which is assigned by the key distribution center, key management, and is used to lock and unlock the message and is unique during the lifetime of the security association. The length is the length of the payload data. The payload is the goose message, including the, the simulation bit, the application ID, etc. And finally, the signature, this is a secure HMAC, which is a key hash message authentication code, which is like a CRC. It's a cyclic redundancy check, which is used for authentic authentication and integrity checks. In this section, we'll review all the components that are used in a secure readable message configuration. First, we have a key distribution center, KDC. This is a system that is responsible for providing keys to the users in a network that share sensitive or private data. Each time a connection is established between two devices in the network, they both request the KDC to generate a unique password, which can be used by the system users for verification. The protocol used to access the KDC is known as GDOI, which is the Group Domain of Interpretation. The GDOI protocol is, provides a secure key exchange between the KDC and the devices. SEEP is a simple certificate enrollment protocol is used to communicate with the certificate authority that is responsible for issuing and managing certificates to the device. And finally, OSCP is the online certificate status protocol, which is used to communicate with the registration authority to verify and validate the publisher and subscriber certificates. Here's a simplified sequence of events to establish secure communication among Routable Goose publisher and subscribers. There are two major exchanges going on. One is the certification, which is used to authenticate all devices exchanging keys. And two, security followed by the distribution of symmetric keys used by the publisher or subscriber for signature encryption. So we begin with step one, and this is to provide the Argoo security support for devices that is dedicated to obtaining a certificate. The devices request the next 509 certificate from the Certificate Authority, the CA, using the Simple Certificate Enrollment Protocol. Step 2, the Certificate Authority verifies the users and signs the certificate and sends it to the devices. Once the certificate is obtained, the publisher subscribers establish a connection with the KDC server using the GDUI protocol. The devices share their certificates with the KDC server and the devices request the KDC certificates. The KDC and the devices verify each other's certificates. Next, each party, the KDC and publisher and subscribers, contact the registration authority using the online certificate status protocol. They send their own certificate and the other device's certificate for validity as well as revocation status. So what I'm saying here is that each, each device, the subscriber a publisher, also has a copy of the KDC certificate as well. And they send both copies for verification to the, uh, to the registration authority. If the verification succeeds, the devices contact the KDC for a symmetric key. The KDC sends a symmetric key to the devices. These keys are used for signing and encrypting the Routable Goose message. As per the standard, these keys need to be updated at least once every two days through a process called rekeying. This can be done either through the pull mechanism where each, key, where each device repeats steps three to six, or a push mechanism where the KDC server sends the new keys to all members of the group, usually in one multicast message. The KDC server is the one that decides when the keys will be changed. And finally, the Argus communications commands using the symmetric keys. The certificates that were requested during the secure key exchange have a breakdown similar to this. First, we have a serial number. This is used to uniquely identify the certificate to distinguish it from other certificates. We have a subject, which is the name of the identity the certificate is issued to. We have a signature algorithm this is the algorithm used by the issuer to sign the certificate. We have a signature, the actual signature to verify that it came from the issuer. The issuer is the name of the entity verifying information and issuing the certificate. So this is the certificate authority. We have valid from, so this is the date the certificate is first valid from. 
The valid two is the expiry date. Key usage is the purpose of the key, of the public keys, whether it's in, in cipher, a signature, or a certific, certificate signing. Next for the public key, this is the authentication of the identity to ensure that you say who you are. Or I should say, you ensure you are who you say you are. Then the fingerprint algorithm. This is the algorithm used to hash the, the public key certificate and create the encryption. And the last one is the fingerprint, which is the code to unlock the certificate. In this section, we'll take a look at how testing is handled in IEC 61850. Let's discuss what the mode types and quality test flag represent. The mode represents the status of the device. The Q.test bit is the quality test bit. When the device is in test mode, the bit is set to true. For normal operation or non-test mode, it is set to false. The Q.test bit can only be true if the IED is in test mode and the IED is, ex is not experiencing an error. Let's review these different configurations. On, the application is enabled, all communication services work, and we get updated values. The Q.test is set to false. The on block status is where the application is enabled, all communication services worked, we get updated values, but the element is blocked from operating. The Q.test bit is set to false. Next, we have the test mode. This is where the test mode is enabled, we get updated values, the output data is controlled, and the Q.test is set to true. Next, we have the test blocked. This is where the test mode is, this is where the test mode is enabled. We have updated values, but the output data is blocked. The Q.test is set to true. And finally, the last one is off, where the function is disabled, we have no outputs, and the Q.test bit is set to false. Methods for testing IEC 61850 system components in an energized substation remain available in addition one. Test mode allows the operator to control the functional testing of the, of the elements while controlling the conditions of the outputs. We can control the mode of the IED by a control service such as an HMI through either software or digital signal from a DMS. We can also control the mode via a GOOSE as a control service via remote input or a RX GOOSE Boolean or use the test quality flag. Based on the configurations for test parameters, we'll determine whether the output relays will operate. Let's review the different configurations available. First, we'll take a look at the mode where it's set to off. The test bit is set to false. The Q.test is equal to false. The logical node is disabled, and we have no output control. Next, we'll take a look at the mode is set to on. So here, once again, the test is equal to false, the Q.test is set to false, but the outputs are active. Next, we have the mode where it's set to test. So of course, the test bit is equal to true, the Q.test is set to true, and we have the ability to force the contact outputs for testing. The next mode is test blocked. Here we have the test is equal to true, the Q.test bit is set to true, but there's no contact outputs. The mode is useful while performing tests while the, the device is connected to a live system. So with all this confusion, not all the vendors were supporting this form of testing. In the next section, we'll take a look at the revised way of doing testing. In this section, we'll take a look at the Goose simulation bit and how it impacts testing. IEC 61850 Edition 2 cleared the confusion associated with testing the IED. Addition 2 added the feature where the device can either subscribe to the Goose message or from a simulator. With the advancements in test equipment, they have the ability to generate, generate simulated Goose messages. The LPHD logical node has the data object defining whether the IED will be accepting real or simulated data. If the LPHD sim object is set to true, it will accept signals with the simulation bit set to true as well. If the LPHD sim object is set to false, it will accept only real signals or where the simulation bit is set to false. Let's take a look at how the different types of signals are handled. Maintenance testing in cases such as IED maloperation require it to be tested before putting it back in operation. 
In the typical case, this requires sending a testing crew to the substation to perform the testing, a time-consuming and a very expensive process. The use of protection systems in a digital substation environment allows the testing to be performed remotely. However, the use of both sampled values and the goose messages is required for the end-to-end -end testing. For the testing of part of a scheme that is affected by the modification, it is possible to do the remote testing using the testing features from IEC 61850 Edition 2, the simulation bit and the goose message and the different modes of the tested function elements. This supports the ability to remotely test a subset of functions and their elements while keeping the rest of the system in operation. Let's look at how real and, and simulation input signals are processed if both signals are injected at the same time using the goose simulation bit. The emphasis on both the IE, on the IED's LPHD1 logical node simulation bit and the simulation bit of the signal. If the IED simulation status is equal to false, the signals for the simulation bit set to false will be processed. If the IED simulation bit is set to true, it will process signals with the simulation bit equal to true. Then the signals with the simulation bit set to true will be processed. Now what happens if the ID simulation bit is set to true, but we stop injecting a goose message with the simulation bit set to true? Then the ID will not have any signals to process unless the ID simulation status goes back to false. In this section, we'll take a look at mirroring control information used for commissioning and testing purposes. The feature of mirroring of control information was added to IEC 61850 edition 2. This supports the possibility to test and measure the performance of a control operation while the device is connected to the system. Let's follow through the steps. A control command is applied to a controllable data object. As soon as the command has been received, the device shall activate the data attribute OP received. The device shall then process the command. If the command is accepted, the data attribute OPOK -OK, shall be activated with the same timing as the wired output. The data attribute TOPOK -OK, shall be the same shall be the timestamp of the wired output and the OPOK -OK signal. These data attributes are produced independently whether the output is wired or not. The wired output shall not be produced if the function is in mode test block. They allow therefore an evaluation of the, of the function including the performance without producing an output. Let's review how it's possible to test a device that is connected to the system. In our example, we want to test the performance of a main protection that receives sampled values from a merging unit and trips the breaker through a breaker IED over a process bus. In the logical node LPHD of the main protection relay, the data object SIM shall be set to true. The logical device for the protection function shall be set to mode test. And a logical node XCBR for the circuit breaker protection shall be set to the mode test blocked. A test set will send a sampled value with, this, with the same identifications as the ones normally received by the protection ID, but with the simulation flag set to true. The protection ID will now receive the sampled values from the test device and will initiate a trip. The trip is sent as a goose message with the quality flag of the trip signal set to test. The XCBR will receive and process that trip. However, no output will be generated since, since the logical no mode is set to test blocked. The output can be verified through data attribute xcbr.position.opok and the timing can be measured through the data attribute xcbr.pos.topok. Next we'll look at uh, NREF. To provide test inputs, Addition 2 supports the naming of incoming signals in a special reference data object at each logical node known as NREF. These data objects are broken down to two data attributes. One is a reference to the object normally used as an input, and the other is a reference to the data object used for testing. Testing allows us to virtually disconnect the terminal blocks. So to provide an example, we have a logical node with a PTOC. We've got a mode that's set to on. The in reference signal is the phase A current. And the testing portion is the test enable, which is set to false in this example. 
Let's review the testing that's associated with the NREF signals. Once again, the idea here is to be able to test the system without influence of the process. So to begin, the LSVS, or the logical node sampled values, is set to simulation mode. The LPHD logical node is set to simulation mode. We have the face time we'll see. A logical node is enabled for operation. The protection trip logical node is enabled for operation. The XCBR circuit breaker logical node is set to test block to prevent the output, the output from operating. Next, the test client sends a sampled value message with the simulation flag set. The signal is accepted, triggering a time over current operate flag, triggering a trip condition operate flag, which in turn triggers the circuit breaker element to operate. The OP received and operate OK are returned back to the test client for validation. And this is all done while the IED is connected to the process. So this concludes this section on the mirror control information. On a final note, let's review the 61850 features and how they compare between Edition 1 and Edition 2. In Edition 2, the size of the field names were doubled in size. So when you're working with Edition 1 and Edition 2, you must respect the Edition 1 limitation. There's an expanding use of naming based on functionality in Edition 2 compared to limited function functional naming in Edition 1. Once again, when working with both Edition 1 and Edition 2 devices, the Edition 2 devices must use the Edition 1 naming convention. In Edition 2, three new groups were added and all IED functionality were mapped to a logical node. Uh, during design and commissioning, discrepancy must be verified. New common data classes were added in Edition 2, which are not backwards compatible with Edition 1 and require the use of GGIO mapping. There's a new expanded XML schema in Edition 2. So when viewing or creating schema, you need to make sure that the application you're using supports both Edition 1 and Edition 2 schemas. There's new test capabilities were added to Edition 2 in the form of a simulation bit and test mode for the logical nodes, which Edition 1 does not support. And finally, in Edition 2, new substation configuration language files were introduced. First, the IID, the instantiated IED description file, and the SED, system exchange description file, which are not supported by Edition 1. Let's recap the material we covered in this module. First, the introduction of logical devices that were specific to a category of, of operation within the IED. The expansion of logical nodes to cover all function elements of the IED. The introduction of the routable goose, why it was needed and how it differentiates from the standard goose. Next, we looked at how we maintain security of the Routable Goose by encapsulating the data into a session protocol data unit and the security of keys, encryption, and authentication of the devices involved. Next, we looked at how we can perform Goose testing while the device was connected to the process with the different types of modes. Off, on, testing, testing blocked. We looked at the simulation of goose signals using the simulation bit and how we were still able to verify operating and timing tests while connected by not affecting the process. And finally, we reviewed the differences between Edition 1 and Edition 2 and the points to keep in mind when communicating between devices using 61850 Edition 1 and Edition 2. This concludes this module and thank you for watching.